Newton, but our next award goes to the most promising newcomer of 1959, Anthony Newley. Ah, yes. This was a very proud moment in my career. And at the same time, a, a very sad one. Sad because it marked the end of a, a long and unique career. You see, up until this moment, I had never won an award of any kind. And I felt that I was different, you know what I mean? I think I can honestly say, with a note of pride in my voice, that I have not won more awards than anybody else in show business. If I may, I, I'd like to show you some of the many awards I have not won. Excuse me, man. In 1952, I didn't win the Best Actor of the Year Award. And, as you can see, I didn't win it again in 1953. In 1954, I was fortunate enough not to win as many as three awards. No, I lie. Four. I didn't pick up the Best Actress of the Year Award. But 1958 is what I call my... my 1958 is what I call my golden year. Not only didn't I win as many as four awards, but I also failed to pick up the Pulitzer Prize, the Rockefeller Center Award, an OBE, a knighthood, you name it, I didn't win it. And now as I, as I leaf through my scrapbook of memories, I'd like to recall, if I may, some of the outstanding awards I didn't win. Now this is a shot of me not receiving the Best Actor of the Year award. And as you can see, this is not Sir Alec Guinness giving it to me. Or is it? Come out now, they've all gone. Come on, boy. Come on, lad. To heel. Well, it's a lovely day. I think I'll walk. No. I didn't even win the Best British Spy of the Year award. <laughs> splendid record of not winning practically everything. But now, of course, I've gone and ruined it all by winning this wonderful award. And rumour has it that after my last TV appearance, I should probably win the award as the most promising TV personality of the year. This, of course, has got to stop. And so now we'd like to offer you a spectacular, which I'm sure will put me right back in my class. Oh, yes. I don't believe you've met my sister. No, I haven't met no, your... Darling, not I've promised her an award. Excuse me. Sing for your supper and you'll get breakfast. Songbirds always eat if their song is sweet to hear. Very nice. Sing for your luncheon and you'll get dinner. Dine with wine of choice if romance is in your voice. It's a better act than a singer. I heard from a wise canary trilling it's makes a, a female no, willing. No, so <laughs> little swallow, swallow now. Now is the time to sing for your supper and you'll get breakfast. Suppers are not dumb. They don't buy a crumb of bread, it said. So sing and you'll be fed. No, I think it's an anthem and you'll be spectacular. Sing for your supper and you'll get breakfast. Songbirds always eat if their song is sweet to hear. Sing for your dinner and you'll get luncheon. Dine with wine of choice if romance is in your voice. I heard from a wise canary trilling makes a female willing so little swallow swallow now sing for your supper and you'll get breakfast songbirds are not dumb 
they don't buy a crumb of bread. It said, so sing and you'll be. Dance and you'll be. Sing and dance and you'll be fed. Thank you, girls. It's a good idea, but we won't do it. Hello, can we come in? This is the most promising newcomer show. My name is Tony Newley, as you've probably gathered. We, uh, I was wondering if I might introduce you to some of the fellas, some of the backroom boys of the show. Of course, you realise, of course, that a, with a show like this, there's so many people involved, it wouldn't be fair for me to take all the blame. I'd like you to meet some of these backroom boys. You all know where the little back room is, don't you? First of all, I'd like you to meet a very good friend of mine, Keith Smith. This way, Keith. <laughs> Keith, uh, Keith appears in all our shows. We don't ask him, he just appears. Our choreographer, Lionel Blair. <laughs> who, as you all know. Our writers, Sid Green and Dick Hills. <laughs> yeah, you didn't expect the film. Who, for my money, are two best script writers in show business. But then, of course, uh, I don't pay very good money. I'd like to introduce you to our musical director, Jack Purnell. Purnell, come <laughs> Yeah. He's still trying to sort out what happened to the music in the first song. Didn't you nip in yeah. a bit quick? I'm oh, sorry, Jack. Didn't yeah, we'll really get a chance to no. start No, well, we'll do it tomorrow, we'll shall we? There are notes here. Yeah, yeah okay, Jack. Well, Last and not least, here she is, the lovely girl you saw in the open caption. She's not actually in the show, but I'd prefer to take my salary this way because the income tax people get nothing, you see. <laughs> well, there they are. These are the people I've chosen to help me not win an award this year. And as you can probably see, they're all the best people for the job. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you can go now. Thank you. Yeah. I'll see you, uh, see you down the labour. I had thought tonight of telling you about a wonderful thing that happened to me about three weeks ago. That uh, great actor Orson Welles offered me a part in a new play he's doing with, with uh, who was it, Sir Laurence Olivier. Of course, I was very chuffed that two such distinguished actors should, you know, probably the best actors in the world should have offered me this part. Then I thought that if I mentioned it tonight, it might sound a little conceited. You know, so I thought I'd better not mention it at all. You know how people talk. So, uh, I thought, you know, forget I've mentioned it at all. Instead, I would like to tell you something about the show tonight. I promised to do the show some time ago, which was actually the reason why I couldn't appear in this play with Orson Welles and Sir Lawrence Olivier. But, you know, I don't want to talk about it. As you've... Uh, <coughs> many of you will appreciate how difficult it is to put a show like this on, you know. I mean, the real art of good television is to make it look smooth and slick. But I'm sure many viewers don't realise the hard groundwork that goes into a show like this. I mean, the, the hours of, of script conferences and the many, many sessions we spend with the musical arrangers selecting the music. Orson Welles actually called me personally to offer me this part in this play. <laughs> but of course I couldn't do it because I was doing this show, but I don't want to mention it. Another very, uh, another very important fact about doing a show like this, of course, is, is you must have the right kind of talent around you who know exactly what you want. You know, people like Sir Lawrence Blair, uh, I mean, people like Sir Orson, uh, people like Jack Parnell, who couldn't have played the part if Orson Welles had offered it to him. <laughs> there were two parts actually in the play. I, I, I was only offered the one. The other was a woman's part. <laughs> Another very important consideration in a show of this kind is the choice of guest artist. You know, they've got to blend in with the actual show. And I spent a long time sorting out who I should ask along this evening. Of course, I couldn't ask either Orson Welles or Sir Lance Olivier because they are busy rehearsing a new play in which they offered me a part, you see. But uh, the person I've asked along this evening is someone who can sing better than Orson Welles or Laurence Olivier stuck together. In fact, if you did stick them together, they still wouldn't be as exciting as lovely Shirley Bassey. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
this heart I will sing to you Long after stars have lost their glow the most promising newcomer, thank you, lovely Shirley Bassey. And now to more serious matters. When we come to look at the state the world is in today, we can't help feeling that some of the most promising newcomers of the past have not lived up to expectations. Take, for instance, the case of man himself. Man the thinker. Man the athlete. Man, conqueror of the world. Let us go back to the very beginning. This is man. What went wrong? In 5000 BC, he is a very promising newcomer. Gifted, upright, mobile, and possessing one feature that distinguishes him from all other animals. He thinks. <laughs> Homo sapiens, the highest order of the primates. Next came the natural helpmate and compliment to Homo sapiens, woman. Or Homo woman. Then there was the forbidden fruit. And <laughs> the serpent.
Oh. <laughs> If I say I love you, do you mind? Make an idol of you, do you mind? If I shower you with kisses, if I tell you, honey, this is how I think of heaven, do you mind? I want to whisper, whisper sweet nothings in your ear. Nothings that are meant for my love alone to hear. So then if I say I love you, do you mind? I make an idol of you, do you mind? shower you with kisses if i tell you honey this is how i think of heaven do you mind i want to whisper whisper sweet nothings in your ear Do you mind, baby? I make an idol of you. Do you mind? Boom, 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 boom. If I shower you with kisses, if I tell you, honey, this is how I think of heaven. Do you mind? Do you mind? Honey, do you mind? Excuse me, I'm, I'm terribly worried about this opening, you know, this music you've cut out. Do you realise that to cut music out, you've yeah. got to be a member of the union? You can't go just slicing yeah. crotches and quavers Sorry, and leaving dead segues all over the place. All right, I hope you understand this. Thanks, Jeff. Well, it's just not right, you know. OK, Jeff. Well, we might have a strike on our hands or something right, if you Jack. do that sort of thing. See you around the boozer. Uh, actually, I am. Uh, <laughs> many people say that hands can tell a story. I don't personally believe them, but uh, uh, to prove it, I'd like to show you a little something. We call it hand jive. Ready, Jack? Go! Once upon a time, there was a hand. It was a teenage hand. One day he went to a coffee bar to see what was cooking. Sitting in the corner, he saw a female hand. Uh-uh, she wasn't waving. She was just drying a nail varnish. He could tell straight away that she was a vamp. So he decided to get acquainted. Um, uh, do you live locally? But she went straight into her shell. Uh, say, what's this crazy don't wanna know? You're a cute chick, baby. Come on. Daddy-o, don't bite. Come on, baby. But no dice. For a while, he sat there not knowing what to do. Then he got an idea. But she turned him down flat. How about a cup of coffee, baby? Two coffees, please. He decided it was time to get to know her better. But she was still a little shy. But then, one cup of coffee led to another, and soon they were rocking and rolling with the rest. And then, when the dance was over, they went home arm in arm. When they reached her door, he tried his goodnight kiss. But she said, I hardly know you. So, he set off disappointed. But, miracle upon miracle, she called him back. And they kissed. And she knew she had him hooked. 
After that, he found he was calling her daily. Until they finally became engaged. And then with the church bells ringing, they became, as they say, as one. And suddenly, he found he could do all sorts of things he couldn't have done on his own. Like washing socks, tying nappies, signing checks. But it soon became the old problem of incompatibility. To begin with, they had different jobs. He worked as a guide to the gentleman's, and she did exactly the opposite. But he had to exert his manly authority. And she, the weaker sex, answered in the only way she knew. So for the first time in their marriage, he struck her. She struck him. Then he struck her and she struck him and they suddenly found that they were applauding. I met her underneath an umbrella, underneath an amber umbrella we met. The sky was grey and I looked like a fella who was definitely gonna get wet. I didn't have to be a fortune teller or a mystic llama from the heart of Tibet to know at once she was my Cinderella anyway I would have taken the bet. The park was empty, a flowery world of our own. Except for raindrops, we were completely alone. My mind went round and round like a propeller. I stammered, so I sounded like a Greek alphabet. My poor feet seemed to dance a tarantella. A fiery as a Spanish seguidilla. Underneath an umbrella. Underneath an amber umbrella we met. Brunhilde Jane, or even Petronella. She had a name I'll never forget. And I had to sing that song because Tony newly wrote it. And quite delightful it was too. Any newcomer to show business has to have immense powers of concentration. And nobody possesses the ability to concentrate to such a degree than Anthony Newley. Let us watch him concentrating whilst he drives his car. That's a nice little figure she's got there. And that's not a bad little redhead over there either. Don't you signal, mate, will you? The number of people still living because Anthony Newley is such a brilliant driver. Sterling Newley, they should call me. No, his car's always breaking down. Tony Brooks Newley, that's it. Oh, what a darling. Legs are a bit fat. 
wonder what she'd do if she knew Anthony Newley thought her legs were a bit fat. She'd probably say, who's Anthony Newley, like the rest of them. Hello, red light. Look at that perk sitting in that great big car. If you think you're going to get away before me, mate, you're mistaken. I'll just slip it in the first, ready. R.J. Clump, grocer. A. Longbottom, chemist. The name some people have. If I had a name like Longbottom, I wouldn't stick it up where everybody could see it. I'd be quite a bad. E. Philpotts, engraving company. Open day and night. Open day and night for engraving. <laughs> Come on, lady, sort them out. Why are they open all night? Who wants engraving done in the middle of the night? <laughs> I can just imagine it. I know it's three o'clock in the morning, darling, but it's just the time for a quick engraving. <laughs> There's something very sinister about it. I wonder if they engrave all night in New York. Probably only do it in London. London, city of sin, where they have all night engraving. <laughs> Another young lady that doesn't want to live, looked half asleep. Probably been to an all night engraving party. <laughs> oh, watch it, lad. Police car behind. <laughs> I wonder what the police are doing about this all night engraving. <laughs> it's corrupting the youth of the country. Tell me, Councillor Jones, do you have much trouble with teenage engravers? <laughs> well, it's not all of them, you know. <laughs> Most of them are quite decent. But then you get a few of these engravers coming in, and before you know where you are, they're all at it. <laughs> Whoops. Sorry, mate. It's every man for himself in this traffic. You'll soon get that sprayed. That's a nice little movement she's got there. I wonder if she'd like to come on a moonlight engraving party. <laughs> oh, this traffic. I wonder what's on the radio. I'll never let you go. Why? Because I love you. Same old rubbish. <laughs> Tell me, sir, what made you take up engraving? Well, I don't think it's any worse than rock and roll. And if I want to take my girl engraving, that's my business. Anybody who wants to say any different, I'll punch him up the throat. Yes, thank you, sir. Get back, you idiot. Get back. He must be doing 70 easily. Good job I'm up here on the pavement. <laughs> Tell me, madam, do you believe in engraving before marriage? Oh, yes, my boyfriend and I are already engraved to be married. <laughs> Here we are, home at last. 45 minutes from door to door, that's not bad. Wait a minute. It's the same door. <laughs> I'm supposed to be at work. Oh, uh, I've got a touch of the all-night engraving. Taxi. Taxi? Taxi! Taxi! Welcome back to the All Night Engraving Show. <laughs> Before we say goodbye tonight, I feel we ought to get to know a little more about the person whose name bears this show. I mean, who is this Anthony Newley? And, you know, what's he like? Is he the genius he says he is? And we don't want any of those carefully edited interviews either. We want the truth. First of all, let's ask some of the people who know him and have worked with him and, and love him, have to say. First of all, let's ask Keith Smith. Oh, Tony? Well, as his best friend, naturally, I'm going to stick up for him. There's a lot of jealous people in show business say that he hasn't got any friends and doesn't do any entertaining. It's not true. He's got lots of friends. I've got one of them here. And as for entertaining, well, I've been up in his flat and there's been friends there at all hours of the night. 
Sometimes there's two friends there, in which case he makes me entertain one friend in the kitchen while he entertains the other friend in the lounge. You see more friends hopping in and out of his flat than anybody else I know. Okay. And it's because I'm biased, you see, because I can't I know just how much entertaining goes on in that yeah. place, especially yeah. late at night when it's all. Thank you. Good luck. Tony Newley. Well, I admit, when a lot of people first meet him, they get the wrong impression. They feel he's a bit conceited and selfish and generally hard to get along with. But when you get to know him as I do, you'll find that deep down, he's quite obnoxious. <laughs> Tony Newley is oversexed. Well, I don't know uh, Tony personally very well, but speaking just as an orchestra conductor, I'd say that he has a very good sense of pitch. When he hits a note, he's so near, it's fantastic. <laughs> the band love to accompany him, because it doesn't matter. <laughs> Against him, on the other hand, though, he can't read a word of music, and I must say that. Uh, speaking as the musical director, that's no help to me at all. One of us ought to be able to read music. <laughs> oh, yes, I'd like to say something about our star this evening. As a choreographer, naturally, I have to work with many big names in this business. Dave King, Alma Cogan, Harry Seeker, Martha Askey, Bruce Forsyth, all big names. But I can honestly say there is one name I will never forget, and that is Tony Newby. Uh, Anton Dooley. Tom Dooley? <laughs> you may think it impossible for a performer to act a scene from Hamlet and follow it immediately by singing a pop song. When you've seen Anthony Newley do it, you'll know it's impossible. <laughs> is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep, no more, and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep. To sleep, a chance to dream. Ah, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life for who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong? The proud man's contumely? The pangs of despised love? The law's delay? The insolence of office? And the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveller returns puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience doth make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought, and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry, and lose the name of action. Of course, that, of course, was from the other side of my old man's adjustment. <laughs> very, very, very good, Tony. Was it average? Yeah, 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 yeah. And now, Tony Newley, the, <laughs> the singer. <laughs> I want to tell you about girls who are made to love and kiss. And who am I to 
interfere with this Is it well? Who can tell? But I know The good Lord made them so Am I ashamed To follow nature's way? Shall I be blamed If I'm made so gay? Does it pay? Who can say I'm a man and kiss them when I can? Girls were made to love and kiss. And who am I to interfere with this? Does it pay? Who can say that I know the good Lord made them all the same? Am I to blame thank you darling am i a drag dear or shall i shout Hurray! does it pay thank you. who can say i'm a man and kiss them when i can And kiss and who am I to interfere with this? Who is it well? Who can tell? Hell I know the good Lord made them all alike. Am I ashamed to follow nature's way? Shall I be blamed to, to, if I am made so gay? Who can say? Is there money in it? I'm a man and kiss him when I can. Baba, you're a man and kiss him when I can. Kiss the girls, kiss all they girls. Ooh. We'll never let you go. Why? Because we love him so. <laughs> Hello, Did you like that? That's only, here, yeah, that's only the B side. But it sounded like it, Tom. Yeah, thank you, darling. Well, you know what I think, Sher? I think what? that you should put a very strong song on both sides of a record, you know, not just a, an A side and a B side. How about the edges? Yes, you could put one there as well, of course, yes. Tell me, Sher, how long have you been singing? Oh, when I was a little girl. When you were a little girl? Yes, how long have you been singing? Oh, months, months now, I've been singing. Yes. Yeah, my, my singing career, Cheryl, actually started in a film called Idol on Parade, and I sang a little song in it and went immediately to number three. You might have heard of it. It went like this. I've waited so long a lifetime to sing for someone to stay right out of my dreams. Have you had any hits, sir? Would you say? Who's got a match will strike him. Don't say it all. Depends. Who wants to help me burn my candle at both ends? Yes, that's lovely. I remember that one. Of course, then I did another one. It went to number seven. Personality. Ooh. Personality. <laughs> personality. You want the personality. You talk personality. Oh, personality. Oh, what more can I do? Kiss me, honey, honey, kiss me. Throw me, honey, honey, throw me. Don't care even if I blow my top, but honey, honey, uh -huh. don't stop. And I had that record too. Then, of course, I did an all-time winner, of course, which went something like this. I'll never let you go. Why? Because I love you. I'll always love you so why because you love me how about that then? i will love you as i love you all my life every kiss from you
each one warmer than the one before As I love you more and more and more Because I need the money. Oh, never mind, Rita. I still love you. If you were the only boy in the world, yes. and I were the only girl, nothing else would matter in this world today. We could go on loving. Garden of Eden, just made for two, with nothing to spoil the view show. I would say such wonderful things to you. How many records did you say you sold? Of why? Hmm? 500,000. Hmm. Hmm. And I would say such wonderful... Th How many did you sell of As I Love You? <clears throat> About a million. About a million. Mm -hmm. If you are the only boy in the world, and I were the only Here we go again. What's good about goodbye? What's fair about farewell? You know, a broken heart can come from such a broken spell. Your love could bring eternal spring. Your kiss could be a magic thing Your smile could be a shining light Burning from day to day More lovely from night to night But if you should stay away Our dreams would go astray our song become a sigh Say so you'll smile forever Say so you'll smile But never say goodbye It's been fun You and I But we must Say goodbye 